Hi. UN Sustainable Development Goals require a 90% purge of the human population. So what I'm going to do in this video is we're going to do an engineering back of the napkin estimate for the sustainable population size of the Earth. And let me get into the reasons why. In the trailer video T1, which if you go into the trailer video list, you can see this video. This video makes the argument that the only solution for the advancement of the human race is to develop starships and move the population of the Earth off the Earth to other places. The, ca the caveat is this requires at least 500 times the speed of light in order for this to be a reality, for this to be effective. Okay, now after I did this, uh, this video, um, I didn't consider, well, gee, is anybody on the Earth even considering what to do with the burgeoning population of the Earth? And so I went and did some looking up, and I found that, uh, the, yes, the UN is, and they call this Sustainable Development Goals. I think this used to go by the name Agenda 21, but that kind of got all the conspiracy theorists, because uh, it sounded pretty ominous. Okay, and if you go to their website, which is here, they list 17 goals to get the human population to a sustainable level among the Earth. And we're, we're going to concern ourselves with this number 11 and 12 here. Okay, now 11 is sustainable cities and communities, and 12 is responsible consumption and production. And this little infinity sign here is very important. This means whatever we do has to last pretty much forever, forever and ever and ever. Now there are critics of this Agenda 21 or Sustainable Development Goals. And their second, uh, there's multiple uh, critical points. The second one is basically, I'm not going to read it to you, is the UN uh, documentation of this does not outline exactly what they believe the sustainable population of the Earth is. And of that sustainable population level, what is going to be the, the standard of living for the people that are living in that sustainable mode? Okay, they have not put any numbers down, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you the reason why they haven't. So let's do some simple back-of-the-napkin engineering estimate of world population sustainability. But first, in order to understand the back of the napkin exercise, we need to understand the role of renewable, non-renewables like oil and coal and minerals that we get out of the ground, and as far as how that extends our capacity on the Earth. Okay, but first, a little bit about sustainability. Okay, sustainability, if it's going to last forever and ever and ever, cannot rely on resources that are not renewable. In other words, the assumption is that as a long distance time in the future of the Earth, all the coal is going to be gone, all the oil is going to be gone, and all the minerals that are easy to get to are going to be in, on the surface somewhere in some form that needs to be recycled. So essentially there's going to be no mining because there should be nothing left to mine. And therefore, the sustainability requires 100% recycling of everything. Okay, and an important point is that oil right now is responsible for a tenfold or better yield of food production in terms of fertilizer, pesticides, uh, being able to move food long distances under refrigeration so it doesn't spoil as far as packaging and food preservatives and additives to keep that food from spoiling on the way to your, uh, to your table. So what we're going to do is play a little simple game to help you understand. This here, this little square represents the uh, the surface, not the water, but the surface of the earth, the land surface of the earth. And every section of earth has to be devoted to something, either it's population, it's uh, allowing place for biodiversity, just let nature run free, uh, areas for food production, uh, areas for energy production so we can heat the homes of the people, areas for synthetic growth. Like for example, we're going to use wood to synthesize chairs and tables and cabins or whatever they're going to be the form of housing. And then there's going to be a cropland associated with, you know, herbs and, you know, for medications and hemp for rope and all kinds of other things that are not necessarily trees for synthesizing the other things that are needed. 
Okay, and again, everything has to come from the sun or be recycled. There's no mining going on. There's no drilling going on. So this would be the end goal. Okay, now let me show you how oil and coal distort that. Energy density in coal and oil is three times the density of wood. But the more important part is that coal and oil don't really have an above ground footprint. Okay, and we'll get to that in a second. But the other thing interesting about coal and oil is they have a much hotter flame. So with coal and oil you can actually smelt steel to be able to build high rises so you can put people in a much more uh, dense footprint and also the steel to develop railroads to move that food that you process uh, great distances uh, and, and also to be able to build farm machines to help you uh, harvest the food real efficiently and also to fuel the train and the harvesting so you can move and harvest the crops with great efficiency. And so this allows the development of very densely populated cities, cities that are 10 times the density of the surrounding suburb as far as population density. It's probably even more than 10, but let's just keep it a nice round number. Okay, and again, the oil-derived synthetic fertilizers, which began production in the 30s, and the pesticides have improved crop yields by at least a factor of 10. And along with refrigeration and preservatives and packaging, uh, we've reduced a lot of waste from where that food is grown to where it's consumed. And it's because of this oil and coal and synthetics that we have been able to sustain a much more dense population of the earth than could be done with the traditional means pre-oil. And so what we have today is we still have some people living in suburbs that you know are not very dense, but then we have a lot of big cities where we have 10 times the people. But because this here, these blocks over to the right, these are underground. These do not take up much surface space of the earth. And because they don't take up surface space, we can devote that surface space of the earth to other things. And because they develop the synthesis, the packaging, and all that other stuff, we can grow 10 times the amount of food we could grow prior to the advent of oil. And because of that, we can put people in denser spaces, we can grow food in denser spaces. That allows still enough room for nature and, and, and room for recreation. This would be like uh, golf courses or uh, theme parks or whatever you want to dedicate land to for having fun. Uh, thanks a lot. Come on, dude. I need you to get your big fat ass off my... Thank you. Yeah, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> Come on, dude. <laughs> Very helpful. So uh, let me back up a second because of the interruption from my buddy there. And so people would say, oh, well, no, this, this oil does not force the consolidation of growing and crops. And, and yes, it does. Because when I grew up in Connecticut, in the woods of Connecticut were these stone walls all throughout New England, running for miles upon miles upon miles of the woods. And we kids would be like, well, why did people build stone walls in the woods? Somebody said, well, it was the old farmers. So it was still, why did the old farmers build the stone walls in the woods? Nobody had an answer. It turns out that these areas where the stone walls were all deforested for growing crops. And because New England has rocks all over the place, when they cleared the field in order for farming, they just put all the, piled all the rocks along the edges of the fields for as a place to store them. Now along the roads, they made them a little bit nicer. Okay, and this is a, can be shown in a picture from circa 1900. It might be hard to see its poor quality, but this is Reading Ridge looking north from Churchill Road, circa 1900. And you can see barren field with stone wall, another field behind it, stone wall, another field behind it, stone wall, and a single farmhouse. If we look at the satellite picture of this area today, uh, it's all wooded over. As a matter of fact, 20, 30 years ago, this would have been completely all woods. Okay, and, and uh, these uh, new McMansions were put up for people could use this land other than for farming, they're using it for, you know, suburban living. So, because when I was a kid, that these areas were all forested over. So, um, and this I think is the original farmhouse over here that is, this over here is the farmhouse that was in the photograph. Photograph was probably taken from right around here, looking this way. 
Okay, so the reason why this occurred is because it was more efficient to grow the, the food out in the Midwest where they had much better soil, not all these rocks, and it was easier, cheaper to ship it by train to your local food store, and so local farming kind of became inefficient and, and went by the wayside. These farmers could not make, could not earn a living uh, plowing these rocky lands. Now there's certain farms and, and orchards still available, but they're more of a boutique kind of operation, I think. Okay, so what is the sustainable capacity of the earth without coal and oil? That's the question. Well, if we look at oil versus population chart from this here, we see that oil, which is the red line, went to pretty much to zero at circa 1900. And the population of the earth in 1900 was 17, 1.7 uh, billion people. Okay, but the question is, the earth, the, the earth wasn't densely populated. The earth can certainly hold one, more than 1.7 billion people pre-oil. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a particular area of the earth that had a high density of population that was, had reasonably modern conveniences like steam locomotives and farms and the whatnot. Okay, and that we're going to look at is 1900 Europe. In 1900, Europe had 400 million people. This was BP4 oil. Okay, now, but we have to remember, though, that this used, they still had coal, and they were using whale oil for, for other synthesis, and they were getting food from other places and importing stuff from other places. So it is not totally self-sustaining. But 400 million people, that's a lot. you got to remember that if you look at the statistics, the United States at this time only had about 75 million people. And it's interesting that the United States is only up to about 360 million people. So we're still not as densely populated, or still not as many people in the United States as there were in Europe at, at, in 1900. So we're going to use this, the density of the people in Europe, as the density throughout the world, with the knowledge that this is probably too many people because they're sustaining themselves with oil and other things. But we'll compensate for that in a bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a a, a, a map of the earth which shows pretty much where the green areas are and where the desert areas are and we're going to focus in on Europe and what these numbers this is 1.9.7 this is I'm, I'm assigning a number to approximately how much of the area is not water okay now here 0 0.3 is probably too much but I'm accounting for that there's a little bit of people in here so what we're going to do then is we're going to take the 400 million population divided by approximately 3.8 squares that have habitable area and we're going to say so it works out to 105 million people per block of ha habitable area and then what we're going to do and, and you can do this on your own and see what number you come up with I'm not doing anything above this latitude or below this latitude and for most of the areas in the northern latitude I'm just putting 0.2 because it's so cold up there now Europe is an exception because there's a thing called the Gulf Stream where warm water from the Caribbean goes north and actually warms Europe up. Without that Gulf Stream, Europe would be as cold as parts of Alaska. So it's that Gulf Stream that makes Europe a very, you know, a seasonable place to live. So I'm not putting any numbers for the desert areas. And certain numbers count for two, like this, this whole block here I'm counting as point 0.1. I'm, I'm putting point 0.5 for all of Australia, and this point 0.5 refers to this entire block here. So if we, and then these numbers over here is the summation of the rows going to the right. Now you can put your own numbers and see what you come up with. Okay, so I came up with a number of 24.5 blocks. So if we take 24.5 blocks times 105 million, that's 2.6 billion people. Okay, at the same density as Europe was. Now, depending on how you judge the, the, the blocks of land, you can come up with more, you could come up with less. Okay, but now we're going to compensate because this 2.6 billion people is living at 1900 existence with no extra capacity for every, anything else, not even nature. And a, a typical engineering thing is divided by two, and this is kind of justified because we need to account for the, the loss. Uh, we, in other words, we got to get rid of the, the. We have to compensate because they're using coal, mining, and other imports. So we're going to divide by two, 
uh, for, for just an engineering divided by two and to compensate for the... So that leaves us at 1.3 billion people. But this is without any luxury. This is just living and existing without having any fun, without doing anything fun, without any kind of luxury. So... And this is what I just said on the previous slide. I guess I improved it. So, but if we want luxuries, let's divide by two again. In other words, what I'm talking about luxuries is, you know, renewable energy, electric cars, heat exchangers, television, internet, you know, light bulbs. Okay, and so when you divide by two again, you come up with a 650 million people. Okay, my friends, that means we'd have to do a 90% extermination of the people or elimination, whatever politically correct word you want to use here. And interestingly enough, this number coincides or is pretty close to the Georgia Guidestone recommended, recommended population level for the Earth, which is 500 million. Nobody knows where the Georgia Guidestones came from, so I don't know how they arrived at this number, but it comes close to what our number is. Okay, so get this. Nine out of ten will have to die in order to be sustainable on the Earth. And we have to remember that oil has allowed us to live beyond the sustainable capacity of the earth. We're basically living on borrowed time. When the oil runs out, it's going to be pandemonium. Even if there's an interruption to the flow of oil or an increase in the price of oil, there's going to be pandemonium. Okay, so now it's understandable why the United Nations has not published any details about population and living standard. Uh, it would be cause an outrage and they would, the UN would probably be shut down overnight by public outrage, worldwide public outrage. But the real question is, assuming they have a plan for population reduction, what is it? How, how are they going to do it? Is it going to be voluntary birth control? I don't think so. I think it really does have to be a purge and it's interesting that a lot of movies are coming out about population reduction and purges. So this dovetails with my tra trailer video T1 where I made the argument, we have to break the light barrier or we're going to perish. Okay, again, when I did this video, I did not try to make an assessment of what the actual sustainability of the Earth was. I just knew eventually we'd be unsustainable. I did not know we were unsustainable right now. We're beyond sustainability. So please help. I'm an electrical engineer making advances in electromagnetic physics, mathematics, and the framework of science to develop the foundation for faster than light drive and the abundant energy sources needed to drive them. Okay, now I'm going to put the the links in the low bar, but T0 is a general overview of my site. Uh, T5 will announce a recent breakthrough. And if you could please become a Patreon subscriber, go to www.etherealmechanics.com. If I get a thousand subscribers, I can do this full time. I'm making breakthroughs, but it's slow because I got limited time. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and give me thumbs up or likes or whatever you want to call them. And give Philip some likes too. Thank you very much.